Every so often, John and I buy ourselves a lottery ticket, and we dream of all the wonderful things we do with all that money. We pay off bills. We don't write college tuitions for our nephews. Pay our friends' mortgages, so get on that list. Maybe travel the world and perhaps start a foundation of some kind. But mostly we marvel about what it would feel like to not to worry about it. Like so many folks, we have no idea what that feels like. Many of our biggest stresses focus on finances, and we're not alone. Dear God, just let me win that mega millions jackpot. Everything will be okay. When I counsel couples preparing for marriage, often their most significant area of conflict is not about sex or in-laws, but about money. For money is not just what's in our paychecks or bank account. It's about what that number means to us. Are we spenders or savers? Are we impulsive? Can we delay gratification? Does our bank balance affect the way we feel about ourselves? Questions about wealth and money and possessions crop up frequently in the Gospels, too. In fact, Jesus talks more about wealth and poverty than any other subject. And anxiety about money is often the catalyst for his parables. Take this morning's story, for instance. A young man approaches Jesus and asks him to mediate an inheritance dispute between him and his brother. But rather than be drawn into this family feud, Jesus changes the subject. He doesn't deal with the question of the possessions themselves, but with our attitudes towards them. So he tells the story of a rich man who had such a successful harvest that he couldn't fit it all in one mark. He fantasizes about how he can keep all this wonderful bounty for himself, build bigger barns, and retire in luxury. But in a rare, in fact, unique guest appearance in the parable, God speaks directly to the man. You fool, God says. This is your last night on earth, and you can't take it with you. So who's going to enjoy your riches now? For those of us who check our 401k often, this story might make us squirm. We might ask, what's the problem with planning for the future? Shouldn't we be prudent and practical and make sure that all of our needs are covered? For those of us fortunate enough to make a good living or hope someday to do so, we might take issue with Jesus' apparent condemnation of this wealthy man. After all, the man seemed to earn it. Why should he enjoy it? But these aren't really the questions that Jesus is asking. I don't believe Jesus thinks the farmer's problem is that he had a great harvest, or that he's rich, or that he wants to plan for the future. His problem is that he has no imagination to see beyond his own life. His money, his wealth, has warped his vision so that everything he sees starts and ends with him. And the structure of the parable itself gives us some insight into this. For the man is just having a conversation with himself. There's no one else in the story. It's all about him, and he uses the pronoun I or my ten times in three sentences. I will do this. I will pull down my barn. I will store all my grain. I will tell my soul. He sees nothing beyond himself. So no wonder God had to break in to the conversation. This man's good fortune, instead of creating within him a sense of gratitude, has blocked his view of those around him. But let's think about this. Did he plant the grain himself? Harvest it himself? shovel it into that barn himself, take it to the market himself? No. He would have had servants who are most likely slaves who did that. And was he personally responsible for this bumper crop year? Did he create the wonderful soil conditions with ideal proportions of sun and rain that resulted in this bountiful harvest? My guess is we have to look to a different source for that. No, his great contribution was that he owned the land. And yet, according to him, all of this abundance begins and ends with him. And this is why God calls him a fool, not 
not because he is wealthy or prudent or lucky, but because he has fallen prey to the notion that life, particularly the good life, consists of possessions, of stuff, and that more stuff is better. He's been seduced by the worldview that says we are responsible only for ourselves and our happiness comes from protecting our own. Eat, drink, and be merry, for it's all about me. Now it's easy to condemn this man. He does seem foolish. Jesus paints him as a caricature of selfishness. But let's not forget, it's very easy for all of us to fall into that trap. The culture of materialism is very seductive and pervasive, even more so today than 2,000 years ago. From the time we are babies, we are told that our happiness is found in buying stuff. It plays on our insecurity about whether we are good enough, important enough, lovable enough. The culture of materialism begins in fear, and that fear creates in us a sense of need to accumulate more stuff to stave it off. We are told that there is not enough to go around, and we need to be sure to get ours. And so our lives become organized around a quest for stuff. And that's no accident. Our economy depends on it. Madison Avenue is dedicated to it. To break out of that mode is one of the most countercultural things we can do. But it's really fun. For the rewards of that life are very, very clear. We see the beautiful houses and the luxury cars and the extravagant vacations right in front of us. When we strive for this kind of life, the world rewards us on many levels. What we don't realize is what we have lost in the process. What is the cost of greed? Now, it's not about the money. It really isn't. Money is neutral. It can be used to bring people closer together or keep us farther apart. What Jesus tells us this morning is that when we focus all of our energies on keeping our money, when greed becomes our God, we have less energy for coping what truly makes for a good life. And that is a question Jesus really does answer. What is the good life? In story after story, he reminds us that the good life comes from relationships with God and with one another. And really, the two can't be separated. Whenever we go closer to each other, we grow closer to God. Whenever we feed the hungry, or sit with the lonely, or reach out to the forgotten, or comfort the sick, we are deepening our relationship with God. Whenever we share what we have with those around us, the stronger our bond with our neighbors become. When we step away from the self-obsession and realize our connection to those with whom we share this wonderful world, we are enriched. We are made whole. We are living abundantly. And it has nothing to do with our floral winter. So as much as the Bible talks about money, it talks more so about fear. Or rather, releasing our fear. The phrase, be not afraid, is used 366 times in the Bible, which tells me that we need to hear it at least once every day, including the year. We need to be reminded again and again that fear, not money, is the root of all evil. It is fear that creates greed. It is fear that keeps us apart. The rich man who places all his trust in his wealth is living in fear. He is afraid that if he lets go of his wealth, he will have nothing. That is the world's story. But in this story, we are reminded that in holding fast to our stuff, we ultimately lose it all. Rabbi Lawrence Kushner once said, Wealth is the highly subjective sensation of having more than enough, so much so that there is money to give away. For this reason, wealth is a function of generosity. The more you give, the richer you feel. Imagine if we all 
all lived as if this were true. Imagine what the world would be like if our sense of security and self-worth was not measured by our bank accounts, but by how much we shared with others. Talk about a countercultural kind of move. To feel we are truly wealthy only when we live generously. Sounds like the kingdom of God. But in order to reject that worldly economics of scarcity, we have to release the fearful grip on our stuff. And that is not easy. It takes trust, a radical leap of trust, that the abundance God promises us is real. We are offered this promise in the face of the world's powerful story that tells us just the opposite. The story that glares at us from television and computer screens. It's broadcast over radio waves and in our movies. We hear it from politicians and CEOs and celebrity spokespeople. You are only as valuable as your stuff, is the story we hear. So where do we go to hear another story, one that leads to true abundance? We come here, and we gather around that table, for it is here that we rehearse the countercultural story that Jesus tells us. For each time we gather around the communion table, we are reminded that in God's world, there is more than enough, and all are welcome. That in God's world, no one is turned away hungry. That in God's world, we have no need to build bigger barns. Not when there are more tables to fill. Whenever Jesus breaks the bread with friends and strangers alike, he is reminding them of what true abundance means. In the miracle of the loaves and fishes, a few crusts of bread and scraps of fish generously shared becomes a feast. When Jesus turns water into wine, he shows the guests that God's love never runs out. When he invites the last and the least sit, to sit around his table, he is rejecting the culture of in and out, of haves and have-nots, and enacting what dinner time looks like in the kingdom of God. In a world where people live in fear daily of starvation and poverty, these were powerful glimpses into the reality that God offers us. And they are just as powerful for us today. It's not about the money, not in this parable or in life. It's about real wealth, relationships, connection, and a shared vision of what is truly the good life. For God wants so much more for us than just building bigger barns. God wants us to build bigger community, to live generously, and to share extravagantly. And so as we gather around this table in just a few moments, we celebrate the abundant feast of life, which is not waiting for us to hit the next tax bracket or win the lottery. So let's eat, drink, and be merry, my friends. For together at God's table, we have all that we need. Here, now. Oh.